By now, our speaker for tonight needs no introduction. We have asked you to come here tonight to listen to his lecture on what the Bible says about Muhammad. This is the first of a series of lectures that he intends delivering in the peninsula, the last one being on Tuesday evening in Kensington, Tuesday the 17th of April. We would just like to remind you of what the topic is for tomorrow night, following on tonight's topic, which is what the Bible says about Muhammad. Tomorrow evening, if Allah so wills, in the Rockland Civic Center at Mitchell's Plain, at the same time, 8 o'clock, Ahmadi that will speak on Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. On the reverse side of this pamphlet, which is obtainable outside, you can find the itinerary of his travel through the peninsula and the topics that you will be speaking on. I would like to draw your attention to one in particular, which you will be delivering in the City Hall, Cape Town, on the 14th of April, 1984, at 8 p.m., which is entitled, and although there is an error on the pamphlet, it reads, Crucifixion or Crucifixion as it stands on the pamphlet, one is exactly the same as the other. But the first one should have been spelled X-I-O-N, and the second one, as it is there, C-T-I-O-N. Ahmad Didat will deliver his lecture, and at the end of his lecture, there will be question time. Ahmad Didat. الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده اللهم يا مفتح الأبواب ويا مسبب الأسباب ويا دليل الحائرين توكلت عليك يا رب العالمين ووفوض أمري لله إن الله بصير بالعباد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أرأيتم إن كان من عند الله وكفرتم به وشهد شاهد من بني إسرائيل على مثله فآمن واستكبرتم إن الله لا يهدي القوم الظالمين صدق الله صدق الله مولا العظيم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters I have just read to you a verse from the Holy Quran from Surah Ahqaf that is chapter 46 verse number 10 now Surah Ahqaf actually this verse gives me the cue for this evening's talk the subject what the Bible says about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa is in actual fact a commentary of this verse. Now, how can you find this verse in the Quran? If you have a Holy Quran at home, how will you find this? Because it is very essential that we Muslims get acquainted with Allah's Kalam, with the Book of God. You see, it's no use just listening to lectures and going away, feeling entertained, elated, elevated. We must have 
that kind of yearning to go and check up first hand, verify first hand what the speaker for tonight or any other speaker, he makes mention of a Quranic verse, go and check them up. And by checking up, you are strengthened more in your conviction about what the man has said, if it is true. And if not, you can take exception. You can pull him up. Now, this Surah Ahqaf, in this Quran here, in the Arabic Quran, it's very difficult for us to find. Because the references are not so easily available. But it, in a translation, like this one I'm holding in my hand, by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. In this translation, at the end, there is a very comprehensive index. And if you open the index, and under A, look for Ahqaf, A-H-Q-A-F, Ahqaf, and you'll see there, it says 46, chapter 46. So you open 46, and I said verse number 10, you get verse number 10, and you read it for yourself. Now, every Muslim, I'm appealing to every Muslim, that he must have this Quran at home. You know, this book here, Allah's Kalam, it is so cheap, it's hard to believe that you can buy today a book of about 2,000 pages, that is this volume here, for 7 rands 50 cents. There is not another book on earth, an encyclopedia of 2,000 pages you can buy today for 750. And if you like, you join forces with another brother of yours, or if you want to give to somebody, two for ten rands, five rands each. They're available in the foyer before you part. And at every meeting, inshallah, as long as I'm around, they will be available. 750 each or two for ten rands. Now, the meaning of the verse I have read says, Qul, Allah is is telling our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa in the first instance, and through him he's telling us that we must also do the same. Qul means say. Tell them. Ara'aytum in kana min indillah. Do you see? Can't you see whether this book is from Allah? Wa kafartum bihi. And yet you disbelieve in it. This is now addressed to the unbeliever. Can't you see? In other words, if you look at this book, if you read this book, with an open mind, you will be able to recognize that this is from your Lord and Cherisher, your Creator. It's self-appealing, self-proving, it proves itself. So Allah Ta'ala is reasoning with His creatures, with the unbeliever. Can't you see whether this book is from Allah? Wa kafartum bihi, and yet you disbelieve in it? Wa shahida shahidun min bani Israel ala mislihi. And a witness from among the children of Israel bore witness of one like him. For amana, and they believed, was takbartum, but you are puffed up with pride. In Allah, Allah, zalimin, and Allah will not guide the unjust. Chapter 46, verse 10. Now it speaks about a shahida shahidum min bani Israel ala mithlihi, and a witness from among the children of Israel. Here referring to Hazrat Musa alayhi salam the Holy Prophet Moses, that he bore witness of one like him. And from that we get the title of this evening's talk, What the Bible Says About Muhammad People want to know that how does it come about that you as a Muslim are now expounding prophecies from the Christian Bible? How did it come about? this sort of a situation because it's something you know, un un unnatural for a Muslim to be expounding his case from the opposition's book. Now, the way it happened is this, that I didn't go into a university or a Darul Ulum to learn this science, the science of comparative religion. I was forced into a situation where, as a young man when I left school, I happened to be working in a country shop at a place called Adams Mission Station. Mission Station. Adams is an American board mission. Secular education as well as missionaries were being trained. And I was working in a shop selling sugar and salt, flour, handkerchiefs over the counter. And 
the missionaries who were getting training at that college, an American college, missionary college, they were harassing the Muslim young men serving behind the counter. We are all young men, just left school. And they came to tell us, attacking us, whatever they learned, they used us as a punching bag for practicing purposes. They said, you know, Muhammad had so many wives. He spread his religion at the point of the sword. He copied his book, the Quran, from the Jews and the Christians, and on and on. And they made, made life so miserable for me. I felt like leaving the job and running away. But jobs were hard to get those days. The only thing that was left was either fight back or run away. And you can't fight back without weapons. In other words, knowledge. If you have no knowledge, you can't defend yourself. And by the mercy of God, I came across a book in my boss's warehouse, an old dilap dilapidated worm-eaten book full of mildew. And the title of that book was Izharul Haq, which means the truth revealed. And when I read this, it dealt with the problems of the Muslims in India. When the British conquered India, they realized that at any time anybody will give them trouble, it will be the Muslims. Because power was wrenched out of their hands. They had tasted dominion, power. And once you taste that, you feel like yearning to get it back again. The Hindus, the overwhelming majority of the people of India, they were then as docile as the cows that they were worshipping. There was no fear from that quarter, but they feared the Muslims. So they started pouring in the missionaries into India like frogs in the rainy season. Change the Muslims and turn them to turn, teach them to turn the other cheek and you can rule them for a thousand years. This was the theme of the book and how we were to defend ourselves against the Christian missionary attacks. So I read the book and as a result of that I started reasoning with these students and when I went to Durban it became a hobby with me attending religious lectures on comparative religion, on biblical prophecies. And one of the lectures which put me really into this field actively was one delivered by a certain Reverend Hyten. I didn't know at that time that this Reverend Hyten was a Seventh-day Adventist. He was dealing with biblical prophecies, you know, prophecies from the Bible. And that evening that I was attending his lecture, he was expounding a prophecy from the book of Revelation. In the Christian Bible, the last book is called the book of Revelation. The Roman Catholics, they call it the Apocalypse. Apocalypse. You know, there's a, a, some uh, TV program, video program going on in America. Apocalypse now. It means Qayama, doomsday, now. You know, atom bomb attack, Apocalypse. That is the title of the last book according to the Roman Catholics. And the Protestants, they call it Book of Revelation. In chapter 13, verse 18, there is a prophecy about a beast. Beast means an animal. And the number of that beast is 666, triple six. And this reverend went on to expound that evening that that beast mentioned in that book is the Pope of the Roman Catholics. I didn't know that this man was a Seventh-day Adventist. I was just wondering, so how can you talk about, you know, a man respected by millions of people, you know, as a great man, Pope means father, as a father, religious father, and this man was trying to prove that he was the beast mentioned in the book of Revelation. And the way he went and proved his case was, he said, you see, this number, 666. If you take the Latin for the vicar of Christ, vicar means a representative of Jesus Christ. The vicar of Christ in Latin, if you give numerical values to these letters, it comes to 666. So he proved his case to his audience that that beast was the Pope. The latest that the Christians have come out with is that they say that this beast is Dr. Kissinger. Now how does that come about? You know, they're very ingenious. These missionaries are so ingenious, you know, you marvel. How did they get wahi, ilham, or you know, is the Holy Ghost coming and telling them what happened? How do they discover these things? 
So he says, you see now, this beast, the number of the beast is 666. So we must now give numerical values to our alphabet. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K. You give them numerical values A, 6. B, 12. C, come on, come on, how many? 18. D, 24. Can you see? E, 30, and so on. You grade them by sixes, every letter of the alphabet, and you write down Dr. Kissinger. And you give those numerical values, and you get a grand total is 666. So, so he says, well, it is Dr. Kissinger, and so on. But now look, it is not for us to enter in this type of controversies. It's not for us. Keep out of it. I'm just trying to show you how ingenious the Christians are in trying to prove their cases. But now, I heard other lectures, and I read literature on the subject of biblical prophecies. And I was told that this book, the Bible, speaks about Gog and Magog, Soviet Russia you know, the devilish kingdom. It speaks about Israel coming into being. It speaks about the Pope. I said, it speaks about so many things. Then what does this book say about Muhammad? Now that crept up in my mind and that question I kept on starting asking people questions. I said, look, the learned men of Christianity, what does the Bible say about Muhammad? If it speaks about Israel, speaks about Russia, it speaks about the Pope, surely this book must have something to say about Muhammad. A man who made it possible at that time, it's a thousand million Muslims today, but at that time we were 700 million. I said, a man who made it possible for 700 million people to believe in Jesus and to honor his mother Mary, to defend her against the calumnies of, of her enemies. Surely this book must have something to say about such a man. So I went on my search, research, wanting to find out what does this book say about Muhammad. At that time, I didn't know this Quranic verse, but I went on a search. And it was about a time when I was to go to the Transvaal. And in the Transvaal, like most of you, my brothers and sisters, you know, you are, most of you are bilingual. You speak English as good as Afrikaans. Most probably Afrikaans is the home language, but your English is as good, good, as, as, good as your Afrikaans. On the average, you are more bilingual than most Afrikaners. You people, the colored as well as the Malay, you are more bilingual, speaking both languages equally well compared to the average Afrikaner. That is my discovery. So while going to the Transvaal, they too, my people, even the Indian Muslims, they also speak Afrikaans. So I was going on a lecture tour, so I said, look, let me try and practice a bit of Afrikaans. And to do that, there was nobody around me to speak Afrikaans to. So I started looking in our telephone directory in Durban for the DRCs, the Dutch Reformed Churches. And I found a church, DRC. I phoned. I said, look, Domini, that's what you call a priest. I said, look, Domini, I'm interested in religion, and I'd like to come along and have an exchange of views, sharing God's word. So you know, that the person on the other side, he can sense it, that this person who's speaking to him, now mind what meticulous English we speak, he can sense it from our tone, intonation, that this guy is an Indian. As much as you, when you come to Durban and you speak to me English, I can make out you are a Kiptonian. You will say, how? I say, look, I know. You and the way you speak is something different from the way we speak. It's same English, same language, but even then, there's something in your tone that tells us you are a Kiptonian. You don't realize that, but we do. As much as you realize that this guy's come from Natal. So the guy senses it, that this guy's an Indian, he says, sorry, it's very busy, no time. Number two, sorry, very busy, no time. Number three, sorry, mm -hmm. Number four, five, six, seven, eight. I was persistent. I had the patience and the perseverance, you know. I wanted to practice a bit of Afrikaans, so I must find a customer. So the number 13th was my lucky number. Usually it's the unlucky number. You know, for Westerner, 13 is a very unlucky number. You know that. On our airways, there is no row number 13 on any of our planes. If you don't know, next time you travel on the plane, check up. There's 12, 14, 15, 16, there's no 13th row in any South African airway planes. You didn't know that. Yes, they're so superstitious. Blocks of flats, 
They have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, no, 12, 8. And there's no 13, 12, 8. <laughs> you know, this 13 is an unlucky number, and Friday the 13 is double bad luck. You see? So number 13 happened to be my lucky number, and according to appointment, appointed time, a Saturday afternoon, I went to meet this Dumini van Heerden of the DRC. He met me on the veranda, and he sought permission, if I didn't mind, he said, to have his father-in-law along in the discussion. Oh, I said, not at all. So he took me into his library, and I began with the question. I said, Dumini, what does the Bible say about Muhammad? And without any hesitation, he said, nothing. I said, why nothing? Does not the Bible speak about the rise of Soviet Russia? He said, yes. About the coming into being of the state of Israel? He said, yes. And about the Pope, the beast, 66? He said, yes. Then I said, what does it say about Muhammad? He says, nothing. I said, surely it must have something to say about this mighty messenger of God who made it possible for 700 million people to believe in Jesus Christ. So the Africana, his father-in-law from the free state, he said, you know my boy, I didn't have my beard then, you see. So he said, you know my boy, he said, I have been reading the Bible for the past 50 years. If there was any mention about Muhammad, I would have known it. So I said, are there not hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament regarding the coming of Jesus Christ? So the Dumini said, not hundreds, but thousands. I said, look, I'm not here to dispute a single one of those thousands that you're talking about. But can you t show me one place out of the thousand prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ? Show me one place where it says that the name of Christ, Christ is a title, it's not a name. When Hazrat Isa salam, was born, Jesus Christ, when he was born, he was not named Christ. He was named Jesus, according to the Bible. Actually, Esau in Hebrew, Isa in Arabic, Isis in Afrikaans, that's nearer to Arabic and Hebrew. They have Latinized it by adding a J, but we won't go into that. In the Gospel of St. Luke, we are told, it says when he was eight days old, he was circumcised and named Jesus by the angel when he was in his mother's womb. What was he named? Jesus. So the word Christ is a title, it's not a name. He was named Jesus, not Christ. So the prophecies are about the coming of a Messiah, translated Christ. But I said, is there a single place where he's mentioned by name? That the name of this Christ who is going to come, his name will be Jesus. That his mother's name will be Mary. His supposed father will be Joseph the carpenter. That will be born in the reign of Herod the king, in Bethlehem, and so on. Is there any such details? He says, no. Then he says, how do you know that those thousand prophecies refer to Jesus? He says, you see, you have to reason, you have to deduce, you have to infer. I said, what you're actually doing is you're adding two plus two, adding two and two together to get your answer. He said, yes, you are reasoning. He said, yes. So I said, look, why shouldn't we do the very same thing about Muhammad? In a thousand prophecies, you don't find a single place where the man is mentioned by name, and yet you say those thousand refers to Jesus without name. Why do you expect me to show you in your Bible Muhammad spelled out M-U-H-U-M-M-E-D? Why do you ask me? Why do you demand from me that? At that time, I didn't know. My knowledge was limited. I didn't know that Muhammad is mentioned by name. Wallah, is there. By name. But it is in the original. You see, in the Song of Solomon, in the Bible, in Hebrew, chapter 5, verse 16. Chapter 5, verse 16. In Hebrew, that is supposed to be the original language of the Old Testament. This is what it reads. It's a hikko mamittakim vi kullo muhammadim zehdudi vi zehrei bayna Jerusalem. Muhammadim im is a plural of respect in Hebrew. You take that out, is Muhammad, Muhammadim, is there in Hebrew. But they translated it into English as altogether lovely. That my beloved is altogether lovely. 
Now when you say all together lovely, you can't imagine that it's Muhammad. And in Afrikaans, I was looking up the word, it's very difficult for me to pronounce. But I tell you, it's so funny, you know, the translation of that altogether lovely, that most of you, you can't even pronounce that Afrikaans. It's so high above your heads. You can never guess, in a thousand years, you keep on reading, uttering that phrase. You'll never know it's talking about Muhammad. But in the original, the word is Muhammadim. But I didn't know it then. So, I said, you see, if we are reasoning about Christ, why shouldn't we reason about Muhammad? So he said, no, that is quite fair. So I said, please open Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 18. Now in the booklet that is given to you, when you go home, look up this verse. And master this verse. Because look, the days of the professionals are over. I'm telling you, it's not the professional's job. You say, why don't the sheikh propagate Islam? Why don't the imams propagate Islam? Why doesn't Ahmad Didat do this? No, no. Each and every Muslim must get involved according to your capacity. And I can't imagine that people who are responding in such great numbers to these lectures, that you're not coming here to be entertained. You want to get some knowledge that you can use. And we are giving it to you in black and white. What I'm talking to you now, it is in that book. You go home, look it up, write it on a piece of card, put it in your pocket, and memorize the verse. Memorize it. Once you memorize it, Repeat it, repeat it, that every opportunity you get, practice it. As the Christians are doing on you, you do the same. We must share. They want to share the heaven with you. We are prepared to share more than that with them. You know, our curry and rice as well as heaven on the other side. They can only share heaven. Cost them nothing to give heaven to you. You know that. He is not prepared to give you a cup of tea or bhajjas or samosas. Never. But you go to the Muslims home, they come along and they eat our food. They eat our biryani, our samosas, our tea, and they want to make nests in our head. Now look for a change. It is about time that you start sharing something more than heaven. Heaven costs you nothing, but at least share something more than that. Your, your kusistas, you know, and your tea. So I'm asking the Dumini, I said, please open Deuteronomy 18, 18. And when he opened it, I said, look, I'm trying to learn it in Afrikaans, and if I am... I would like you to correct me if I'm wrong. You know, my pronunciation, help me. So saying, I said, what is written there? He said, Prophet sal ek for hala for wek, eight di mida for hala brewers. Suas ye is, and excel me word in se mondele, and hasel an hala se, alas vat ek hom befiel. So he says, very good. I don't know whether I was murdering it, but he said, it's very good. You know, he says, a good, good try. So I'm asking, who is that prophet? In English, it says, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren like unto thee, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. To those of you who might want to listen to this in the Bible, from the Bible in Arabic. See, it's so beautiful. It's nice to know because when you go among the Christian Arabs, I was thinking when I was young, I wanted to go to Lebanon before this trouble started. I said, I want to go and speak to the Lebanese Christians. And how much nicer if I can quote them in their mother tongue. Like the Africana quote him in his mother tongue. You are bilingual. You must master this in both languages, English and, and Afrikaans. If you can master another language, another dialect, go ahead. The Bibles are available in 2,000 different languages. Endless go. So I start learning that in Arabic to go to Lebanon. He says, Ukimu lahum nabiyam min wasati ikhwate mithlaka wa ajalu kalami fi famihi wa yakallamahum bi kulli ma usihi bihi. I wanted to go to Israel, talk to the Jews. So I learned it in Hebrew. Nabi akim lahim mikariw akhaihim kamo khawin. Look, I do it in a dozen different languages because it opens up doors. Because if you can speak a man's mother tongue, his heart opens out to you. He's prepared to listen to you, even if you're murdering the language, as I was doing. I could have been murdering Afrikaans, but he loved it. He loved to listen to me talk. An old, I mean, a grown-up person who knows nothing about Afrikaans, and he's trying to rattle it off. So I'm asking, who is this prophet? So he said, this is Jesus. But I said, it doesn't say Jesus. He said, no. You see, prophecies are word pictures of something that is going to happen in the future. 
And when that thing actually comes to happen, you say, this is the fulfillment of that. What was said is now being completed, accomplished. That is a prophecy. And this prophecy refers to Jesus. I said, why? He said, you see, it says, Suas ye is. Prophet sal ek fa hala fa vek eid di mida fan hala bruas. Suas ye is. Suas ye is means like unto thee, like you, like Moses. And Jesus is like Moses. So I said, how? He said, you see, Jesus was a Jew and Moses was a Jew. I said, yes. So Jesus is like Moses. He said, you see, Jesus was a prophet and Moses was a prophet. I said, yes. So he said, Jesus is like Moses. I said, anything else? He said, no, this is what he can think of for the moment. So I said, look, if these are the only two standards, of finding a candidate for that prophecy, then this prophecy will fit every Jewish prophet after Moses. David, Solomon, Ezekiel, Elisha, Elijah, Zechariah, Micah, name them, Zephaniah. There are 70 different prophets mentioned in the Old Testament, in the new John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam. So I said, why should not this prophecy, you know, fit any one of those other prophets and why to Jesus because they were all Jews and they were all prophets so why make fish of one and follow the other why Jesus and why not any one of the others there was no answer so I said you see Dumini I think that Jesus is not like Moses for three reasons number one I said according to you now mark my words I said according to you Jesus is a God. He said, yes. You know, he's very happy because they believe that Jesus Christ is God incarnate, God Almighty coming down to earth as a man. He said, according to you, Jesus is God. But I said, Moses is not God. He said, yes. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses. Number two, I said, according to you, Jesus died for the sins of the world. He said, yes. But I said, Moses didn't die for anybody's sins. They said, yes. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses. Number three, I said, according to you, Jesus went to hell for three days. Imagine, they sent the God for, to hell to go and retrieve people. Three days he was in hell after his crucifixion. His soul went into hell. Jahannam. I said, according to you, look, we don't say that. We can't say that. That the prophet of God, we believe they're all sinless. And an innocent man, Allah put him into Jahannam. What for? He said, I said, according to you, Jesus went to hell for three days. He said, yes. But I said, Moses didn't have to go there. He said, yes. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses. And I could see, you know, beads of perspiration. It was a cold day. Beads of perspiration. And I felt, you know, look, we all have our idiosyncrasies. Every nation has certain characteristics. All of us. You know, the Indian Muslim, he behaves in a certain way. The Malay Muslim, he behaves in a certain way. We all have our characteristics. The Afrikaner has got his characteristic. You see, when you corner him, he says, where's my gun? <laughs> no, that, because he was used to that. You see, look, the gun, the gun. So anytime you corner the man, he's looking for his gun. The Britisher, the Englishman. I think our, our video man is a Britisher with the apologies. You see, the Britisher, when you corner him, you know what he says? Let's have a round table conference. <laughs> Look, these are, these are, you know, we all, we all have some funny, funny idiosyncrasies, characteristics, we have, all of us. So I said, now, before that happens, you know, the man starts looking for his gun. <laughs> Though he's a Dumini, I said, now, shh. I said, you see, Dumini. Look, these, what we are talking about, are hypothetical things. These are not solid facts, hard facts, that li little child, you know, your child playing on the veranda, that child will not be able to understand what we are talking about, about the divinity of Christ, about his redeeming blood, about him descending into Hades, hell. The child can't understand what you're talking about. Let us talk about something basic, solid, simple facts that even a little child can understand. So he was very happy. I said, so in that case, I said, number one, Moses 
had a father and a mother. The Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, also had a father and a mother. But Jesus had only a mother. He had no human father. He was born miraculously. And the Bible says, in the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 1, verse 18, it says, Before they came together, who Joseph and Mary, as husband and wife, she was found with child by the Holy Ghost. In Afrikaans, the fuer that hala, sam hakom het, is a swanger befint et di heli hachies. I said, is that right? He said, yes. I said, dar om, is Jesus ni swas Moses ni, mar Muhammad is swas Moses. I was practicing Afrikaans. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. Number two, I said, Moses and Muhammad were both born in the normal course of things, a man and a woman coming together. But Jesus was created by a special miracle. As is, you know, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1, verse 35, it says, when the good news was given to Mary about the birth of a holy son, she says, how shall this thing be when I know not a man? Means physically, sexually, I have no experience of a man, how can I have a son? So the answer that the angel gives her is that the Holy Ghost shall come upon thee and the power of the Most High will overshadow thee. I says, is that right? We will deal with this in detail under the subject Christ in Islam. But for the moment, this is the point. The point is that he was born miraculously. The Holy Quran also confirms in Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 47, when the good news is given, she says, She said, Oh my Lord, how shall I have a son when no man has touched me? So the angel is made to say in reply, Say, even so, Allah creates what He wills. Say, whenever He decrees a matter, He merely says to it, be and it is. I says, we believe that He was born miraculously. You believe that He was born miraculously. Is that true? He said, yes. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. Number three. Moses and Muhammad, peace and blessings of God be upon all his prophets, Moses and Muhammad, they both married and they begat children. But Jesus remained a bachelor all his life. Is it true? Of course, the Mormons say Jesus had two wives, Mary Magdalene and Martha were his wives. We won't go into that. The bulk of Christendom say Jesus was a bachelor all his life. Is that true? So he said, yes. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. Number four, Moses and Muhammad were accepted as prophets, acknowledged as prophets by the people in the lifetime. No doubt, the Jews gave endless trouble to Moses, Hadrat Musa, endless trouble. They murmured in the wilderness. And he was so provoked. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam, that he addresses his own people. He says, behold a stiff-necked people, an arrogant people, you, my people. He said, ye have been rebellious against the Lord since the day I knew you. From the day I know you, you are like this, a rebellious people against Allah. These are the, you know, the condemnations of Hazrat Musa alayhi salam for his own people. Endless trouble they gave him. But before he died, his people as a whole, they accepted Hazrat Musa as Rasulullah, as the Messenger of Allah. Our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Holy Prophet Muhammad also. His people also gave him endless trouble, you know. The Muslims had to make two hijras to Abyssinia. The early Muslims, two hijras to Abyssinia. Our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and everybody else, the believers, they had to make a hijra, migration to Medina. Even in Medina, they gave him no peace. Badar, Bahar, Khandak. They gave him no peace. But before he died, his people as a whole, they accepted the Holy Prophet Muhammad as Rasulullah, as the Messenger of Allah. History, this is history. Moses was accepted by his people. 
as a man of truth, as a man of God, a prophet. The Arabs also accepted the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as a man of God, as a true prophet of God, as a whole. But the Bible tells us about Jesus in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verse 11, it says, He came unto his own, but his own received him not. In Afrikaans, he had said, and say, Ia mensa het homni an khaniyam ni. He came unto his own, but his own received him not. I said, Is that true? He said, Yes. I said, Dar om. Is Jesus ni suas Moses ni, mar Muhammad is suas Moses. I was practicing Afrikaans. Number five. I said, Moses and Muhammad, they were prophets as well as kings. A prophet is a man who receives divine inspiration to guide his people, but he might not have the power of backing it up to implement the laws that he receives. For example, like Yunus alayhi salam, he delivered his message. He couldn't implement it. Lut alayhi salam, you know his people went for abominations. Allah destroyed the people, but Yunus alayhi salam couldn't do anything. Lut alayhi salam, Yunus alayhi salam, Nuh alayhi salam. All these were prophets of God. They delivered the messages, but they couldn't implement the laws, the Sharia. They couldn't implement it. Yahya alayhi salam. No power to implement. So they were only prophets. Whatever they received, they delivered the message. But Musa alayhi salam was something more than that. He was a prophet as well as a king. Not with the title of a king. But a king, by that I mean one who has the power of life and death over his people. Whether you call him a president, call him a dictator, call him an emperor, call him what you like. If a man has the power of life and death, a simple word, we say he's a king. So Moses was such a man, he received divine inspiration, he delivered the message, and anybody broke the law, the adulterer and the adulteress stoned them to death. And they would be stoned to death. They were told not to do any work on the Sabbath day, Yom Sab, Saturday, no work. Not even picking up firewood. So a man was found picking up firewood. So they brought him along and they stoned him to death for picking up firewood. That was the law. So he had the power of not only delivering the message but implementing the law. Our Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam saying, he was not only a messenger of God but he had the power of life and death over his people. But Jesus Christ when he came, when he came and he was confronted by the Romans, the Jews implicated him and he was brought for trial for treason. That was the trial was for treason against the state that this man is trying to pervert the nation, trying to create turmoil in the nation. So. Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor, questions Jesus. He says, Art thou the king of the Jews? Are you the king? So Jesus says, Thou sayest. That's what you say. So he said, Am I a Jew to say that? But when he was questioned, pressurized further, he says, My kingdom is not of this world. May Konikreik is ni van hier die world ni. If my kingdom was of this world, then my disciples would have taken up the sword to fight, which they didn't do. So my kingdom is not from hence, not from here, not an earthly kingdom. Mine is a spiritual kingdom, meaning I am a prophet of God, trying to guide people spiritually, not to shoot out or kill people, chopping off people's heads. No, no, that's not my job. I didn't come for that. So he says, my kingdom is not of this world. In other words, his is a spiritual kingdom. Moses had a spiritual as well as a material kingdom. The Prophet Muhammad Wasallam also had a spiritual as well as a material kingdom. Jesus had only a spiritual kingdom. He was only a prophet. Is that true? So Dumini said, yes. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. Number six, Moses and Muhammad وسلم, they brought new laws and new regulations for the people. 
Before Moses, the Jews didn't have the Ten Commandments. They didn't have a comprehensive law. They knew certain things about good and bad. They knew about God Almighty, but they didn't have a law. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam gives them the Ten Commandments, and he gives them the laws of ceremonial law about purity, what is pak, what is napak, what is pure, what is impure, what to eat, what not to eat, and every little minutest detail which they didn't have before. New law, new regulation. The Arabs before Islam also had no law. They were an absolutely a barbaric people. A people, a nation that buried the daughters alive. They married the stepmothers. These Arabs, before, in the Yamul Jahiliya, the days of ignorance before Islam. Drunkards, adulterers, gamblers, fratricidal wars over little things they were fighting for decades. Given the master historian, in his decline and fall of the Roman Empire, he describes the situation beautifully. He says, the human brute, the animal in human form, the human brute, almost without sense, is poorly distinguished from the rest of the animal creation. That the only thing that is differentiates him between the animal and him is the form. Ahsani taqweem, Allah has made you in the best of forms. Otherwise, worse than animals. These Arabs, no laws, no regulations. From that, through Allah's Kalam, the Quran, our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in the 23 years of his prophetic life, he transformed them into an angelic people. Thomas Carlyle, one of the greatest thinkers of the past century, he delivered a series of talks in England. And among his hero prophet, he chose our Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not David as his hero prophet, or Solomon, or Moses, or Jesus. He chose the holy prophet Muhammad as his hero prophet. And in paying a tribute, he says to the Arab nation, it was a birth from darkness into light, this new revelation, new message. It was a birth from darkness into light. Arabia became first alive by means of it. A poor shepherd people, roaming unnoticed in its desert since the creation of the world. These were the Arabs. Nobody would give them a second look. The human rubbish. That's what they were. Alexander the Great passed them by. The Persians passed them by. The Romans passed them by. Nobody was interested in this human rubbish. What are you going to do with them? They didn't know the oil was going to come out there. They didn't know. They just passed them by. So see, the unnoticed becomes world notable. The small has grown world great. Within one century afterwards, Arabia was at Granada, that's in Spain, on one hand and at Delhi on the other. Glancing in valor and splendor and the light of genius, Arabia shines over a great section of the world. This is belief is great, life-giving. The history of a nation becomes fruitful, soul-elevating, great, so soon as it believes. Is it not as if a spark had fallen, one spark on a world of what seemed black, unnoticeable sand? But lo, the sand proves explosive powder, blazes heaven high from Delhi to Granada. This is what the message did, overnight, in decades. What the Roman Empire took a thousand years to build, within decades they built an empire greater than that of Alexander the Great, greater than that of Rome. What did it? Is this new revitalizing message. The message of Islam did the job, changed, transformed the nation. New laws, new regulations. Moses brings new laws, new regulations. The Holy Prophet Muhammad brings new laws, new regulations. Jesus Christ, when he was confronted by the Jews, they were thinking that this man is bringing a new religion. So Jesus assures them, according to the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 5, verse 17, 18, and 19, he says, think not that I am come to destroy the law of the prophets. I am come not to destroy but to fulfill. He says, Muni dink that et hakom het om the vet of the prophet the ont bint ni. Ek het ni hakom om the ont bint ni or to fulfill but to fulfill. I said, is that true? That's what he told the people that he had brought no new laws, no new regulations. He has come to fulfill the law. He said, whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments, or shall teach men so, shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall teach and do, shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. He has come, assuring the Jews with no new laws, no new regulations. 
He's only come to confirm, fulfill the previous revelation. Is that true? So he said, yes. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. Number seven. I said, Moses and Muhammad, they both died natural deaths. But according to you, I said, Jesus was violently killed on the cross. According to you. Is that true? He said, yes. I said, Darum, is Jesus' knee was Moses' knee, Mar Muhammad is was Moses. Therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. Number eight. I said, Moses and Muhammad, they both lie buried on earth. But Jesus is resting in heaven. Is it true? Oh, very happy to say yes. And every time he says yes, he's agreeing with you, he's an extra nail. Nail him down. Nail him down. It's a privilege Allah has given you. It is you who choose the role of being a punching bag for them. It is you who choose the role of being a, becoming a doormat for them. This is not the role that Allah has in store for you. He says, Liyuzi hira huwa la kulli. He's given you a deen that is the master overcome and supersede them all. Kulli. Every deen. Whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Judaism, Christianism, Communism, every ism. Islam is destined to master them all. This is his promise. But you want to be a punching bag for them. That's your, your choice. Allah didn't want you to be that. A doormat. Doormat for people to rub the shoes on. That's your role. You have chosen that. This is not your destiny. So, I said, Moses and Muhammad, they both are buried on earth. But Jesus is resting in heaven. Is it true? He said, yes. I said, therefore, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. And I could see again. I said, no, no, we have to soften things up. You see? Before he looks for the gun. So I said, you know, Dumini, what I have been proving to you is simply one phrase. Suas ye is, like unto thee, like you, like Moses. I gave you eight different reasons to show that Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. But it was all to prove that one phrase, Suas ye is, like unto thee, like you, like Moses. That's all. But I said the prophecy, the verse, is more than just that one phrase. It says, I will raise them up a prophet from among the brethren like unto thee. From among the brethren, not from among themselves, but from among the brethren. So I said, who are the brethren of the Jews? I says, you know, Father Abraham, he had two wives, Sarah and Hagar. We say Sarah and Hajra. He had two wives. From Bibi Hajra, he had the first son. He, in his old age, he was old. And he was praying, he wanted to do Allah's work, and said, look, when I die, I don't know what's going to happen to the message that I'm delivering to people. So, Ya Barit Allah, grant me a son, a noble son, a pious son, that he may carry on the good works. And Allah heard his prayer. Allah heard his prayer. And a son was born, whose name was Ismail, in Hebrew, Ishmael. Ishmael, in Hebrew, Shamia, in Samia, in Arabic, and Shamia, in Hebrew, means the same. It means to hear. He says, Samia Allahu liman hamida. When we get up from the ruku, he says, Samia Allahu liman hamida in our salat. He says, Allah listens to the one that praises him. To hear, Samia Allah, Samia. So, Ishmael, El in Hebrew means God. Ilah means God. In Arabic and Hebrew, Ilah both means God. El means God. So Ishmael means God heard. What? The prayer of Abraham. He asked Allah for a son and Allah heard his prayer. Means Allah accepted his prayer and Ismail salam, was born. And for 13 years, he was the only son and seed of Abraham. 13 years. Before Hazrat Ishaq salam, was born, after 13 years. And the Bible says, from among the brethren, the children of Ishaq are the Jews, the children of Ismail salam, are the Arabs, they are brethren one to the other. It doesn't say from among themselves, but from among the brethren. I said, who are the brethren of the Jews? The Arabs. Though out of pride, 
out of pride and arrogance. They are not giving that credit to the cousins. These are their brothers, the cousins. No, no. They make insinuations, you know, against the Arabs about this being birth that Hajra, they say, was a slave woman. She was a slave woman of Egypt. Whereas actually she was a princess of Egypt. However, this aspect we will touch with in one of the lectures, Arabs and Israel, conflict or conciliation. Why this prejudice? We will deal with that then. But the fact of, for the moment is that he is from among the brethren. And I will put my words in his mouth. So I said, now how does somebody put somebody's word in somebody else's mouth? How do you put your words in your mouth? I said, you see, if I were to teach you a language, which you never heard, you don't know, like Arabic, and I tell you, I ask you, I said, look, Dumini, repeat after me. Repeat after me. Qul huwallahu ahad, which means, say, he is God the one and only. So you say, Qul huwallahu ahad. So Allah Samad, God the eternal absolute. So you say Allah Samad. What am I doing? I am putting my words in your mouth. See, these are not your words. You can't utter them by yourself. But what I'm saying to you, you are repeating them. So I'm putting my words in your mouth. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He does not beget and is not begotten. So you say lam yalid wa lam yulad. So wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. And there's nothing like unto him. So you say wa lam yakun lahu kufuwan ahad. What am I doing? I'm putting my words in your mouth. But when I asked you, open Deuteronomy 18.18, and if I asked you to read, and if you read, am I putting my words in your mouth? He says, no. But if I tell you something which you don't know, you never heard before, and you repeat what I tell you, I'm putting my words in your mouth. Is that right? He said, right. I said, exactly. In that very manner, the whole Quran was revealed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad The very first revelation that was given to him, he was in the Ghar Hira, cave of Hira subsequently known as Jabal al-Nur, the mountain of light, some three miles north of the city of Makkah. It was the 27th of the month of Ramadan. He is alone in the cave. And the archangel Jibreel, Gabriel, comes to him and commands him in his mother tongue, Iqra, Iqra, which means read, or recite, or rehearse. And our Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, being an ummi, unlettered, he's terrified. Somebody's asking you to read, and when you can't read, so he says, Ma ana bi qari'in. He said, I'm not learned. So the angel of God commands him a second time, Iqra, read. And again he pleads, he says, Ma ana bi qari'in. I'm not learned. How can I read? The third time, the angel of God, Jibreel alayhi wa sallam, oppresses him hard, and he says, Iqra, bismi rabbi kalladhi khalaq which means read in the name of the Lord and Cherisher who created. So now, our Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he grasped that what was required for him to do was to repeat, because this Arabic word, Iqra, means to read, to recite, to rehearse, to repeat. So he repeated. So Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So read in the name of the Lord and Cherisher who created. So he said, Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. So khalaq al-insana min alaq. So he who created man from a mere clot of congealed blood. So he says, khalaq al-insana min alaq. So Iqra, wa rabbuka al-akram. So read, and the Lord is most bountiful. So he said, Iqra, wa rabbuka al-akram. So alladhi allama bil kalam. So he who taught the use of the pen. So he said, alladhi allama bil kalam. So allama al-insana ma'alam ya'alam. So taught man that which he knew not. So he said, allama al-insana. These were the first five verses revealed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad وسلم, in that cave of Hira. As soon as the angel departed, sweating all over, terrified, he runs home three miles south to his dear wife, Ummul Mu'minin Khadija Tul Kubra, and he says, Cover me up, cover me up. Something terrible has happened. She covers him up, and when he gets out of his excitement, he explains to her what he had seen and his fears that something has gone wrong with me. You know, we talk about other people getting possessed. In those days, it was so much common, this man, that man, that man, in the time of Jesus, you know, he says the spirits went into 2,000 swines and they ran down the hill and they all got drowned in the Bible. Then spirits went into a fig tree and it dried it up from its very roots. And spirits were going into men and women and animals, everything. So now, in that day and age, he's also fearing that something, I think, has gone wrong with me. 
What is this? I hear a voice, a voice telling me to read this. And she said, look, Allah will not allow such a thing to happen to you. You are kind to orphans and the widows, and you are so good, you are so charitable. And she takes him to her cousin Waraka, who was a learned man of the Jewish and Christian scriptures, who was a Christian, Arab Christian. And when he heard the story, he said, you are the messenger of God chosen for these people. I wish I would be alive. I said, these people will persecute you, they'll harm you. But he said, I wish I was alive to defend you then. But these were the first five verses given to him. And in the next 23 years of his prophetic life, according to the needs, telegrams were received. Telegrams. The Quran is a book of telegrams. This is how Allah speaks. He doesn't speak like once upon a time, the fox and the grave, the wolf and the lamb, Baba, black sheep. This is not the Quran. The Quran is a concentrated book. قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدٌ اللَّهُ السَّمَدٌ لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُلَدْ وَلَمْ يَكُنْ لَهُ كُفْوًا أَحَدٌ Four verses. Complete. Chapter is complete. It's an ocean. Now you start thinking about what is this? Ocean. But you read it even with the meaning. He said, now what did I say? What did you say? Uh, so well, God is only one. And what else? He said, well, he doesn't beget and he's not begotten. He's got no father and no son. Yeah, what else? Very difficult. You need a commentary. The Quran is a very concentrated book. Allah talks by telegrams. So, during the next 23 years of his prophetic life, what was given is now contained in this book, the Holy Quran. And it says, when we had reached that point, the Dumini felt that we should you know, cut it short now. So he says, you know, what you are telling me sounds very good. One day I'd like to call you to my church to speak to my congregation. In my mind I said, that will be the day. But he'd like to call me one day. But I said, you see, all this what you're talking about is not important. It's not important. He said, look, we got the veritable Son of God. He died for our sins. He absolved us from all sins. You see, such a nice, nice, cushy feeling one gets. Somebody paying for you. You know, you can speed away 200 kilometers an hour. And when you get caught, Mr. Salim Muhammad is there to pay your fine. How nice, huh? Would you care to slow down? Sally is there <laughs> with this half a dozen supermarkets, you know, to pay your fines for you. How nice. You have a headache and I take the pill and you get healed. How nice. You have a rotten appendix, operate mine because mine is healthy. Huh? Look, this is something that the man loves it. Anybody, we are all cowards by nature. Man is a coward by nature. You know, in the garden, you know, you read the Bible, it tells you that when Hazrat Adam and Mahawa, when they committed that mistake, and when God confronts them, he says, Adam, why are you behaving like this, plucking leaves and putting on yourself? What's wrong with you? He said, no, 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 it's the woman that thou gave us to me. She made me to eat. Look, the coward. He's blaming the poor woman. <laughs> and he's blaming Allah. He said, the woman thou gave us to me. You know, if you didn't give me that woman, I wouldn't be in trouble. <laughs> Look, the cowardliness of man. This portraying that we are all like that. And you woman, he said, no, it's the serpent that beguiled me, blaming the poor snake. <laughs> this is man. This is man. We are all like that. So somebody else die for your sins. What a pleasant feeling you get. You don't have to exert it. You don't have to sweat. You don't have to pray five times a day. You don't have to fast for one whole month. You don't have to straight jacket your life. You don't have to do that. You just have to believe that Christ died for your sins and salvation is yours. So he's got that. What is all this? Why you waste time? It's not important. The important thing is Christ died for his sins. So I said, Dumini, you know, God Almighty, he knew this mentality of yours. What you're talking now, this was well known to him. So in verse 19, he warns. I was reading 1818. We were expounding 1818. But it says, verse 19, it says, and it shall come to pass, means it's going to happen. Allah knew. He said, look, it's gonna, it'll come to pass. This thing is going to happen. That whosoever will not hearken unto my words, which he, that prophet, shall speak in my name, I will require it of him. 
I will rec I'll fix him up. In the Roman Catholic Bible, it says, I will take vengeance from him, take revenge. God is threatening revenge. I said, you know this thousand prophecies, you're talking about Christ? There's not one which is followed by such a threat. God Almighty himself is threatening, he said, I'm going to take revenge. If you will not listen to that prophet, who will speak in my name, and it's going to ca come to pass, it's going to happen, that there will be guys like that, he said, I'll fix them up. God Almighty is threatening revenge. And he doesn't frighten you. We get terrified. Some gangster telling us, hey, we're coming home tonight to put matches to your house. Whew, we can't sleep all night. You know, we want police protection. No? Allah, when he threatens, God Almighty says, I am going to take revenge. And you say, it's not important. And I said, in whose name is Muhammad speaking? Whose name? Whose name is he speaking? He says, it shall come to pass that whoso will not hearken unto my words, which he shall speak in my name. His words, Allah's words, in my name, in Allah's name. I say, in whose name is Muhammad speaking? Look at the book. And this Yusuf Ali's translation has got a very beautiful arrangement. The end verses, end surahs. When you start from the very last, Surah Nas, chapter 114. You start with Surah Nas, every chapter, every page is a different chapter. Amazing. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Next page. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most every page is every chapter different page. Every page, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. In whose name is he speaking? In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Look how this prophecy is fitting the Holy Prophet Muhammad. It's fitting him like a glove. We don't have to pull, stretch, hook or by crook, trying to prove your case. We don't have to do that. It's fitting him like a glove. Every word, every chapter begins. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful. Amazing, amazing. So, I says, you know, what we have to do? Find out. What is this man out to teach you? What is he telling you? Why don't you investigate? Why don't you make sure? What does he say? What is he telling you? He is not telling you that Jesus is not God, but I am God. He is not telling you that Jesus is not the Son of God, but I am the Son of God. He is not telling you that Christ didn't die for your sins, but I am going to die for your sins. Nothing. He's inviting you to the religion of God. Worship God, the Father in heaven, who is the only God, who is the real God. But I says, you know, in the time of Jesus, the Jews were waiting for this prophet to come. You see, the Jews have not produced another candidate. They are not making any claim to that prophecy. The only candidates are what the Christians produce, Jesus Christ and the Holy Prophet Muhammad. But in the time of Jesus, they were still waiting for this prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18. And the proof of that is, you open the Gospel of St. John, chapter 1, verse 19. And you read there, that the Jews sent Levites and priests, learned men, to go to John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam, who was in prison, to ask him, who art thou, who are you? Because the Jews had a number of prophecies, three. They were waiting fulfillment of three prophecies in the time of Jesus. They were waiting for the coming of the Messiah, Masih Christ, translated Christ, Masih translated Christ. They were waiting for the coming of the Messiah, but they had another prophecy side by side that with the coming of the, before the coming of the Messiah, Elias must come first. Elias is a prophet supposed to have gone up into heaven by whirlwind. And before the coming of the Messiah, this man Elias must come first. So when Jesus claimed that he is the Messiah, the Messiah, Christ, they said, where is Elias? So he points out to John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam, that John the Baptist is Elias or in the spirit of Elias. So they were not satisfied with Jesus' recommendation. So they go to John to make sure whether he is what Jesus is telling him to be. So they ask him, number one, first question, art thou that Christ? 
the one we are waiting for, Masih, are you that? Now Jesus was the Christ, we believe that. So he says, no, I am not. He is not that Christ. There can't be two Christ at the same time. Then they ask him, art thou Elias? Then he says, I am not. Now this is giving a lie to Jesus. Jesus says that John is Elias and John says, I am not. Now, who is speaking the truth? Both are mighty messengers of God. According to Jesus, John the Baptist was the greatest of the Israelite prophets. Jesus said, among those born of women, there is not another greater than John the Baptist, Yahya alayhi salam. The greatest man among the Jews, the greatest prophet among the Jews is Yahya alayhi salam, John the Baptist. And this greatest man, according to Jesus, says, I am not what Jesus is saying. So, one of them is not speaking the truth. Can we take sides? No. How can we say that Jesus was speaking a lie? How can we say that Hazrat Yahya alayhi salam was speaking a lie? I said, look, this is the problem for the Christians. Please don't enter into that. It's not our business. Let them solve that problem between Jesus and John. Who is speaking the truth? We don't want to know. But what we are looking for is, they ask him, art thou Elias? And he says, I'm not. Then they ask him a third question, art thou that prophet? And he says, no. Amazing. Three things they ask him. Art thou the Christ? He says, no. Art thou Elias? He says, no. Art thou that prophet? He says, no. Then they remonstrate with him. He said, why then baptizest thou? If thou art not the Christ, neither Elias nor that prophet. There are three questions, three negative answers, and three remonstrances. Remonstrating with him. Why then are you doing this? But you know, the learned man of Christendom, he can't see three questions. He can't see three answers. He only sees two. You take any school child of standard two and you tell him to read that, he can see three. He'll tell you, look daddy, three questions are asked, three answers are given and three times they're saying, why are you doing this if you are not this, not that, not that. But the learned man can't see his program, not to see. You show it to him. You must show it to him. Say, look, simple. Man is like a baby class, you know, you're teaching these children kindergarten, Baba Black Sheep. It is easy as that. Art thou that prophet? And any Bible, any Bible which has what is called a cross-reference, a concordance on the side, any Bible which has that, you'll find the word at, at the point, that prophet, you'll find a number. And you look at the number on the side, it'll tell you, it refers to Deuteronomy 18.18. And we know that that prophet of Deuteronomy 18.18 is not Jesus, but Muhammad. We are not denying Jesus. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of God. We believe in his miraculous birth. We believe that he was the Messiah. We believe that he gave life to the dead by God's permission. And he healed those born blind and the lepers by God's permission. And we are not going to dispute the thousand prophecies they're talking about. That about the coming of Christ. We are not disputing a single one of them. What we say is that this prophecy of Deuteronomy 18.18 does not refer to Jesus, but it refers to Muhammad. That is all. Now, you have to master this. And Jesus Christ gave them a test which would like them to apply. He said, for there shall arise many false prophets and false Christs who will show you great signs and wonders. Miracles. False prophets can do that, he says. Many false prophets and false Christs who will show you great signs and wonders. If it were possible to deceive the very elect, even the chosen one of his can be deceived. Such, prophet, such miracles they can perform. Then how are you going to know the true from the false? He said, by the fruit you shall know them. What produce? What do they produce? By the fruits you shall know them. Do men gather, gather grapes from the thorn or figs from the thistle? Do they? He said, no. Every good tree will be good fruit and every evil tree will be evil fruit. Judge them by the fruits. By the fruits you shall know them. We are not paragons of virtue, we Muslims. We are not. Let's admit it, that we have our black sheep like any other community. But, and I can boast, and I have been boasting, and I have not been contradicted that my people, the Muslims of South Africa, we have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. We don't say we have no drunkards. We have our black sheep, our drunkards as well, who might drink any other Christian or Hindu under the table. We have them too. But we have the lowest alcoholic consumption in the country. We have the lowest gambling rate in the country. We have the lowest prison rate in the country. We have the lowest divorce rate in the country. We have the lowest suicide rate in the country. And we have the highest charity rate in the country. With what God has given us, we are the most charitable of people. We are the most hospitable of people. 
we are the most sober people in everything. Though we are not paragons of virtue, we have our black sheep, we have to admit. We have our crooks and cutthroats too. But as a people, as a whole, there is not another nation or community in this country that can show a candle to us that we are better than you. What did it? This man's teaching. Forget everything. Remember this one thing, that at the present moment, there are 1,000 million Muslims in the world. A thousand million Muslims, one billion. And we as a people, as a whole, we don't drink alcohol. We are the biggest society of teetotalers in the world. People who don't imbibe alcohol. Biggest society in the world are the Muslims. Despite all our drunkards, we are still the biggest society of people who don't touch that stuff. I said, if Muhammad did nothing but freed mankind from this one evil, South Africa, we spent last year 2,000 million ran on alcohol. Last year, we spent 2,000 million, 2 billion on gambling. Very little of our money went there, I hope. My dear brothers and sisters, we have given you this little booklet. Look, take it home, master these verses, master them, memorize them to such an extent that, you know, you can stand on your head and you can rattle it off. That's the only way to learn is that when sub, if you can stand on your head and rattle it off, Prophet sal et for hala for wek, eight dimida for hala bruise. So, so in case you are talking and the guy breaks you in the middle and he takes you off like a shark, you know, you can catch a shark, what happens? He's taking you this way, that way, and you pull it back again and the thing reels again. So same thing happens in a dialogue. You know, I, while at work, while you're having tea, the thing's discussion starts and the guy takes you off. So what about this and what about Khomeini? Eh? We are talking about Deuteronomy 1818, and he wants to know about Iraq-Iran war. He wants to know about this fellow. I said, so if you have mastered it, you can bring him back. Again, where you left off, it's a Suasie is. You know, we are discussing Suasie is. And Excel may word in the Mondele. And Excel may word in the Mondele. Can you see? So you must master this. You owe it to yourself. And I says, the pleasure and the privilege is ours. Allah has given it to us. Li yuzahira hu ala kulli. He's given you a deen that is to master, overcome, and supersede them all. Wakafa billahi shahida. And enough is Allah is a witness to this fact that is going to make his deen to prevail with you or without you. It's a privilege Allah has given us that we can serve his deen. We can do the works of the prophets of God and earn a prophet's reward. May Allah be with you. Wa akhul dawan and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Thank you very much, Brother Ahmad Dirat. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, before we enter into questioning, I'd like to cover a few points. Number one, I did mention at the outset that this is the first of a series of lectures. We invite you to attend all those lectures. The first one after tonight will be tomorrow night at eight o'clock in the Rockland Civic Center, Mitchell's Plain, where, as mentioned earlier, the topic will be Muhammad, the natural successor to Christ. For the rest, we can read it behind the pamphlet. We are making a video recording of whatever has been said and whatever will be said tonight. We make bold to say that there is no copyright to it. If you want to come to the other lectures and you wish to bring with a tape recorder, you are free to do so. If you wish to come and make a video and you can get permission from the authorities at the halls, you're free to do that also. Feel also, feel, also feel free to bring your friends, wherever they may be. Feel free to bring them along to come and listen to the lectures. When it comes to question time, as I look at the people now, there are very few of you that I do know. I don't know how you have received the talk. I don't for one minute believe that you are going to accept or just agree with whatever Ahmadiyya has said. You are free then for clarification or even if you wish to differ with him, please put a question and he will answer. 
All I ask then is that first of all, you wait your turn, number one. Number two, ask one question at a time. And if you have got more than one question, go to the back of the queue if there's going to be a queue. Number three, I would like one thing, that if a person puts a question and you feel in your mind that he is being sarcastic, that he is being silly, or that he is being stupid, please keep your feelings to yourself. Every man is entitled to ask his question. Please do not shout any man down. And when an answer is given from Mr. Dida, I trust you will give him the same respect. Give him a time to answer, and please do not shout him down with another question or with a statement. We now invite anybody to come up to the microphone in the passage here and to put any question that he or she may want to ask. It is over to you. Um, good, uh, good evening, all of you. Now, Mr. Amadidat, I have always heard about you, and my desire was always to talk with you, not in the state to argue or anything else. And I don't want to make excuses, because why that's not a thing. I have heard you were talking about Dumanis. Now, I also want to say something about this, then I'm going over to my questions. There's one different thing. God has also his spirit. Now when I wanted to go to a Bible school, the Lord stopped me from going to CBI in Saria State, Club Fontaine Road. Now, Mr. Amadidat, I just want to get a clearance on this. Not to say that I am going against you, as I've already said, I'm not making excuses. Now, you have said that Jesus is not Muhammad, but uh, Jesus is not, uh, Moses is not talking about Jesus, but about Muhammad. Now, I believe that Mr. Didat had, has also gone to Bible schools, etc., etc., as you have said with your own mouth of selling the sugar, etc., etc., to the other missionaries and how they teased you. I like that so because why it made me laugh, not for a joke, because of the earnestness for your faith. Now, in Moses 18, 18, as you have said, it's true what you have said about that. I agree. But then there's points to go on. I have first taken Matthew, um, Matthew 14, 16, John 14, 16, where Jesus has also said and has talked about someone to come. And I also believe that you say that this is the same, it's Muhammad, right? Now I'm going, I want you just to be patient. I, I'm going on scriptural just to go it and to say why I believe that Muhammad was not Jesus, not to go against, go against the Islamic faith, because that's Christianity, not to go against anyone's faith. And that's what I want to say. It says in Moses 18, 18, that as you say, that Jesus, that God will rise up someone likewise to the one called Moses. That's a fact, as you have said. But then it's revealed to that it was so. It says, you understand Afrikaans, Mr. Ahmad, did that? No, I don't. I'll read it and I'll translate it to you. In Luke 7, that lees in Afrikaans, as jylle miskien hoor dat ek miskien verkeerd trans, leid of so, dan is jylle recht om vir my recht te stel, en so voort. 
Dat lees so, ja. nadat Jesus een wonderwerk gedoen het. Uh, just one thing, brother, before you go on, we would like you to put your question, you know, we would like to be patient with you and not to feel mm. that you are cut down. Mm. If you could put the question, then I can get you an answer, right? Okay. In vrees het allemaal aangegrip, dit was achter Jesus een wonderwerk gedoen het. Die Jesus wat ek van praat nou. Terwijl hulle God verheerlik en sê, een groot profeet het onder ons opgestaan en God het sy volk besoek. Dit was nou die Israëlitische volk wat God daarvan praat. Nou daarom trend, is het dus so, dat not Jesus says also that he is the great prophet, but the people that was even Jewish people, but it was from another city called Nain, they said that a great prophet has risen amongst us. Uh, brother, uh, could I ask you to put your question because you have quoted Luke 7, yeah. where you said that the people have said that uh, mm. God has raised up, that Jesus is a great prophet, mm. and that he's probably the prophet referred to in 1818. Mm. Uh, could you put your question, then we'll get an answer. Okay. If you would like time to put your question properly, then maybe somebody else can come up and ask a question in the meantime. Okay. Okay. Anybody else, please? Assalamu alaikum. Uh, my dear uh, Ahmad Didat, I was very impressed with your, with your speech tonight. But as a Muslim, there is something that is not clear in my mind. And I think a lot of other people uh, would, would also like to get some clearance on this matter. Um, of course, you, you did quote that uh, um, it is said that uh, Prophet Muhammad would be the, would be the one. I mean, uh, you, you said that, uh, I mean, it is quoted that uh, he will be raised from amongst their brethren. Now, <clears throat> of course, this means that he will be a great person. But why did God give him that greatness, uh, which was so short-lived? Why did he achieve that greatness only for 23 years of his life? Why wasn't he a great man from the time he was born? Why wasn't he, um, why wasn't he so great? Uh, I wouldn't say great, but why wasn't he so popular uh, like Jesus was? Why, why did he achieve um, world popularity only years after his birth. Uh, could you explain that to us? I'm sure you will do a, a lot of justice to a lot of other Muslims and non-Muslims in this place. Why did God wait for 40 years before revealing the Quran to the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Suppose the Quran was revealed to him at the age of 30. See, like Jesus Christ, he was baptized at the age of 30 in the river Jordan by John the Baptist. So he said, look, why 30? Why not at 25? And if it was 25, why not at 20? Why wasn't he born with a book in his hand? <laughs> These are questions that you have to address to Allah. You see? As I said, the Quran is a book of telegrams. You remember? The Quran is a book of telegrams from Allah through his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now you have to send a telegram to him, God Almighty. Ask him, why did you wait till the age of 40 before you delivered this message to him? It's not me, it's not in my hands. He chose Moses at the age of 40. He chose the other prophets, David at the age of 40. He chose Jesus at the age of 30. Right. That's his business. When the time is ripe, the message is given. With regards to greatness, you see, if you read, I don't know whether you're in touch with what is going on in the world today. A certain Michael Ash Hart has written a book called The Top 100. The most influential men in history. And you see the number one, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi In the Times Magazine, the greatest leader of all times, Jules Masserman, a Jew, a United States psychologist, the greatest leader of all time was Muhammad. 
Lamartine, in his history of the Turks, he says the greatest man that ever lived was Muhammad. I'll be dealing with this aspect of greatness in the third lecture, I think. Muhammad the greatest. So I hope you will hold your horses till then. Why did God choose this man, you know, at the age of 40? And why is he recognized today? In the lifetime, every prophet, you know, you made a statement. I think that maybe you didn't know. You slipped out of your mouth. That Jesus was a great success. You know, Muhammad had to make migration. His companions had to make two migrations to Abyssinia. Jesus was a great success. That is not true. You know it's not true. You know what was his end, according to the Christian, what they say? The man was killed on the cross. Is that greatness? Is that success? And all his disciples forsook him and fled. They left him in the lurch. All. 100% failure. And today, the Christian world are not following Jesus at all. According to that Michael at heart, he says that, you see, the honor for Christianity should be divided between Jesus and Paul. And actually, Paul is the real founder of Christianity, not Jesus Christ. So even as a religion, the religion that is carrying his name, Christ Christianity, is not his religion. So I think, you know, my son, uh, you should check up these things, you know, before making a statement to say, you know, this man was more successful than the other. The most successful of all religious personalities is Muhammad, according to the Encyclopedia Britannica edition, 11th edition. Most successful. Well, I don't know. Nobody paid. I don't know who paid them, you know, to write that down. The, um, this this, this uh, um, note here, Jesus is not like Moses, but Muhammad is like Moses. Um, Moses, I do believe, performed miracles. Um, Jesus performed an abundance of miracles, but I have no knowledge of Muhammad performing miracles. Yes. Could Mr. Dida just um, elaborate on that? Where, yeah, I'd like to say that uh, Jesus is like Moses because they both, both perform miracles. Uh, the question is, if it's not, well, it's not very clear to part of the audience, that uh, Moses performed miracles, Jesus performed miracles, but he has no knowledge whether the Holy Prophet Muhammad performed miracles. Now, in the book of traditions, more than 300 miracles are ascribed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad But the Muslim does not make an issue of it because those miracles of the prophets gone by are things in books. They are a matter of history. So saying that, look, my prophet did this and your prophet did that. But here, again and again, Allah, but are you listening, brother? I see that you are, you see your head is down there. I don't know whether you're listening to me. If you look at me, then I can address you. Look, look at me. If you look at me, look, your head is right down. No, no, I... You're looking at the video camera, and you are ashamed. Look, you see now, I'm talking to you. Why not come a little forward then, if the light is hurting you? I said the Quran again and again... <laughs> yes. You see, again and again, the Holy Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he referred to the Quran. A living miracle. You see, the miracles of Moses, you know, crossing the Red Sea, right, striking the rock and rivers gushing forth. Miracles of Jesus turning water into wine, killing those 2,000 pigs, drying up the fig tree from the very roots, right. Now, these are things in books. You see, you said, look, man, I don't know whether it happened or it didn't happen. It might sound like a fairy tale to most people. So he said, look, Talk about this is a living miracle. And I'm going to prove this to you, you know, in a lecture in the series, Al-Quran, a visual miracle. In other words, that you today in the 20th century, you can verify that this book is the miracle left behind, a living miracle of Muhammad left with you. You need a little patience for that. But if you look up the books of traditions, there are more than 300 miracles attributed to the Holy Prophet Muhammad but the Muslim does not go out of his way to prove the bona fide of his prophets by those miracles. He said, here, 
A living miracle, you can see for yourself and verify yourself. So I, I, I look forward to seeing you there. Al-Quran, a visual miracle. The living miracle of Muhammad. Thank you. Thank you. That is at Athlone Civic Center in Athlone. To answer the brother's question, to be sure he's got it to say that the Quran is the miracle which everybody can see and touch even up till today. Is there any other question from the audience? Please come forward. Good evening, Mr. Didad. I appreciate your explanation for that particular scripture verse, but I have one question. What you have said tonight, is that authenticated in the Quran? Can you quote a particular verse whereby Muhammad claimed himself to be that particular prophet? You see, the Quran is not the words of Muhammad. This is it. The Quran is the word of God. And God Almighty is testifying. This is not Muhammad's storybook, what he can say, this, make this claim, that claim. So, school, tell them. See, I read at the very beginning. Tell them. Araitum in kana min indillah. Can't you see? Are you blind? Like Jesus told the Jews. He says, you know, the sheep and the goats, they hear their master's voice. How is it that you can't hear your master's voice? You know, you as a human being, you should have more brains than the, cam than the, than the, than the, than the sheep and the goats. If they can recognize their master's voice, Jesus assumes, and God Almighty also assumes, that you as, a, as a, an intelligent creature of his, you will be able to recognize this as the word of God. And in that word of God, he says, وَشَّهِدَ الشَّاهِدُمْ مِنْ بَنِي إِسْرَائِيلَ عَلَى مِثْلِهِ And a witness from among the children of Israel bore witness of one like him. And word for word, we find fulfillment. That Jesus, Moses, through the mouth of Mo Moses, God Almighty speaks, he says, like unto thee, like you, mislaka, mislaka in Arabic, mislahi. So we have this, I have given you more than 20 different reasons to say that, look, this prophecy refers to the Holy Prophet Muhammad. God Almighty makes the claim on his behalf. He said, this is the verification. You read that in that booklet, if, it's, if you have that, the very first verse that's written on the top, introduction, the very first verse on the first page, you'll find that quotation from the Quran. You didn't get that book of ours? Is the Bible God's, what the Bible says about Muhammad? The very first page, you'll see that verse there, which is the confirmation from God Almighty that this is the prophecy finds fulfillment in the Holy Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa do you see whether this message be from Allah, God Almighty, and yet you reject it? It is, and a witness from among the children of Israel, for witness of one like him. Do you see whether this message be from Allah, God Almighty? Now, I had read through the translation of the Quran, and there's one part that struck me when he, when he gave the scripture that, that he received from the angel Gabriel, in the form of the Holy Spirit. When he received it and he gave it to them, I would like to ask you one question, but that is not the, that is not the whole point of the thing is that can, I'd, I'd like to know for sure why, point number one, when he revealed the, the, the Quran, right? When he revealed the word to them, can you tell me why? Firstly, did his eyes turn red like fire and his temper and had a bad temper and yet further down it brought it to, to a conclusion that he had to stress it that way to get the attention, right? But now what I'd like to know is that, can you tell me for sure that the, not to, I speak under full correction, and I'd like to know there is a difference between the Holy Quran and the, and the Bible. There's a very big difference. And from this point, I'd like to read you some scripture he had said, Holy Quran 46, verse 10, do you see whether this message be from Allah? Right? But I'd like to stress you a point because you said you, you had searched from too many to too many. Right? And you went from one point to another point seeking the truth. Right, sir? Seeking the truth. 
concerning the Deuteronomy 18 verse 18. But that is not my point. What I'd like to know is, the differ is can the Quran fully be, fully be accepted as the word of God? But before you answer me, I'd like to read to you something. <coughs> yeah. Uh, could I get, could you put the one question which you would like him to answer? Just one. Right? All right, but I'd first like to read to him the, the script service. And Why I'm, won't you read afterwards? Do you finish continue, your question sir. first, yes. What uh, was the question again? Yeah, it says... Look, you're it, rambling too much. You uh, take, look, I'm an old man of 66 now. And I'm standing on my feet for two hours. Will you please be merciful to me? Mm. Come forward with your question. What is the question? Don't ramble. All right, sir. I'll bring it to you. Uh, you talked about the Antichrist. I yeah. never spoke about the Antichrist. No, about the 666, six, six, the number. So why, why did I never use the word Antichrist in my talk at yes, all? I know, sir. So why are you trying to put the words beast. in my mouth? You talked about the beast. That I meant to refer to the beast. Right, that so right, talk about the, the beast, 666, six, six, yeah. Yeah. Let's hear. But that's not the, the actual point. The question is here in John 8. What is your question? Could you put the question, you yes, can sir. support it with the text uh, afterwards. This is for you, young what man, you is know, truth? the one who has been challenging. You see now, every Christian that comes forward, he has got the spirit. But when he comes to ask questions, the spirit deserts you. I don't know why. Why can't people ask questions? Uh, it's not the same. You know, uh, you misquoting me, you putting words in my mouth which I never uttered. You know, this brother is doing the same. I said, what is happening with the spirit that you're supposed to be carrying with you? Let that spirit help you to ask the question, if right. you have it. Sure, I let's just have it. my question. Let's, let's have it now. I just asked you what is truth. That is what Pilate asked Jesus, which he never yeah. answered. And I answered and asked you to I'm know the difference you. between this the This is the question the that Bible. Pontius Pilate asked Jesus. Sure. What is truth? Mm. And you read there, Jesus never answered that question. Sure. Right. I know. Now, if you want to know what is truth, this is what the Quran says. Al-haqqu min rabbikum wa la takun min al-mumtareen. The truth comes from thy Lord alone, so be not be those of those who doubt. And uh -huh. this is the truth. This is the truth. The revelation of God. Uh -huh. It is the whole truth and nothing but the truth. I this agree is with it. Uh -huh. Whatever God says is truth. Now could I, could I just stress one more point? I like the question. I, one more question. Uh, could you tell me is the God of Allah you serve? And the God I serve is it the same God. You see, in principle, we all believe in the same God. But you have a certain concept of God Almighty if you are a Christian. Are you a Christian? Yeah. And you are a Trinitarian? Huh? Are you a Trinitarian? Yes, Father, right. Son, and Holy Ghost. Right. You see now, that is your concept uh. of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, which we say is not the teaching of Christ. Uh. Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, you see in the Gospel of St. Mark, chapter uh -huh. 12, verse 29, a learned man of the Jew comes to him and says, Master, what commandment is the first of all? Uh -huh. And Jesus answers and says unto him, not for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. No, no. He said the first is, in the Hebrew language, Shama Israelu Adonai Elohainu Adonai Echad which means here, O Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. Uh -huh. This is the first commandment as given by Jesus Christ. See, the first is that Lord God is the one and only God. No man can see God and live. God is not seen at any time. God is spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in truth and in spirit, not in form, not in shape, not in size. Mm. This verse about the Trinity, for there are three that bear witness in heaven, the uh -huh. Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, uh, is in that Bible that that brother no. is carrying. But, in all the modern translation, including the RSV, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, I wonder if you heard about the Revised Standard Version of the sure. Bible, which is the most up-to-date Bible in the world today. This was brought about by 32 scholars of the highest eminence, backed by 50 cooperating denominations. And they have, as a whole, thrown it out, expunged it from the Bible. Would you like to have a look at it? It's not there. This verse on the Trinity is thrown out as a fabrication, as an interpolation. You know who did it? Not Jews, 
not Hindus, not Muslims, but Christian scholars of the highest eminence. So now you are creating a religion of a fabrication. This verse on the Trinity is a fabrication. Jesus Christ didn't teach you that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are co-equal and co-eternal. This is the teaching of your church. No, sir. Where does Jesus say, I and my Father, we are both equal? Does he say any such things? Does he say that he is God? Nowhere. There is not a single unequivocal statement in the whole encyclopedia called the Bible. Not a single, I, I hope you understand my English. Sure. Unequivocal means simple, straightforward, mm. to say, I am God, or he says, worship me. If you can find such a statement, and you have a whole week while I'm around, you just bring that over at any of my meetings from your Bible, where Jesus says, I'm God, or where he says, worship me, and in front of all the people, I will be prepared to accept him as God, and I will be prepared to worship him. Uh. Yeah, right? I agree but I'm you, giving you an opportunity for yeah. next Tuesday night. In your Bible, any Bible, whether it is a, uh, the Roman Catholic version, or the King James version, or the Revised Version, or the Revised Standard Version, or the American Standard, or the Jehovah's Witness Version, any Bible that you can name, bring it to me in any meeting and in front of everybody, I will follow and join your church. How's that? Sure, I would agree with you. Right. So I'm giving you opportunity the uh, next Tuesday night. Sorry, brother. Uh, right, thank you. Is, uh, time is running out according to the people of the hall. And I saw somebody coming up to the microphone with a striped jersey. Please come forward. Um, the, uh, all it, uh, this would be the last question. And could you be brief, please? Okay. Good evening, everybody. Good evening. You said that uh, the, that is the Revised Standard Bible, right? So you see that uh, the Revised Standard Bible has been taken out of the, the Trinity, right? The Trinity Sorry has been taken out of it, right? So what Christians took that question out, uh, throw that uh, portion of the Bible, of the Trinity, what Christian did it? They were the Trinitarian Christians. People themselves were Trinitarians. In Mudaport, Mudaport in the Free State, there was a church synod. And in that church synod, they're asking themselves the question, how many of them that preach Trinity in the church, they believe in the Trinity? Those who preach it. And 85% of the people that were there who preach Trinity, they said they didn't believe in the Trinity. This is how good it is. So it has no biblical basis. Your Trinity is not there. Jesus is not God. He never claimed to be God. Nowhere does he say, I'm God. Nowhere did he say, worship me. So this is a creation of the church. See? And your scholars, and if you read here the testimonies about this Bible, this Bible here, what church do you belong to, my son? Your church might be also one of the members who were responsible for this. What church do you belong to? Me. You. No church. Yes, you. What church? Jesus. Are you a Roman Catholic? Jesus, no. What? What church do you belong to? Say the name of the why are you ashamed of your church? Why don't you say what church you belong to? It's not a church that matters, sir. Right, listen. Church of England newspaper. Church of England, that's the Anglican. They say the finest version which has been produced in the present century, this Bible, finest version. Times Literary Supplement says, a completely fresh translation by scholars of the highest eminence. Language which is not only dignified but also contemporary. Fullest use of resources of modern scholarship. Life and Work says, the well-loved characteristics of the authorized version combined with a new accuracy of translation. And the time says, the most accurate and close rendering of the original. This one. Most accurate and close rendering of the original. And they found it fit to throw out the Trinity. They found fit to throw out the word begotten in John 3.16, that this was also another interpolation. They saw fit to throw out the ascension, which is also, according to them, an interpolation. Now, if you like, at the end of the meeting, you can have a look at this Bible, and then you can question me at the next meeting if I'm wrong. Uh, you see... Sorry? That, um, uh, just, no, I want to state that point that you just said now. Right. You see that uh, the, the, uh, the Trinity has been thrown out of that Bible, right? Correct. So I asked you a question, what Christians did that? And you couldn't give me an answer. 30, 50 cooperating denominations no, of Christians. Who are they? They were Baptists, they were Anglicans, they were perhaps Roman Catholics. 
52 denominations went to do that but, job. But that's not, that is not the, the, the well, answer that I asked Then you. the answer is you didn't tell me what church you belong to. Maybe your church was also involved there. No. <laughs> Sorry, that was the last question. And I would like to take this opportunity to say many, many thanks for your attendance tonight and for your participation, one and all, of those who did. Please roll up at the other lectures if you would like some enlightenment further. Thank you. Qur'ans are available. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good night, ladies and gentlemen.